Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Um, my name is Laura Joseph. I'm owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people around the world through our live streams. Um, we empower animals and the people that care for them. We do that through our live streaming services um, that focus on positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis. And if you want to find out more about we, what we do here, you can visit our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. You can always get in touch with me personally. My email is laura at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, so with that being said, good. Give my normal introduction. It's good to be back um, at the center here in Northwest Ohio, where we are in monsoon season. <laughs> Continuous rain, I think, over the past week. Good morning, everybody. Hey, there's Sharon. I was just hanging out with Sharon last week. Hey, Susie, Liz, Heather, Shelly, Tim, Chris, Jude. Um, thank you, everybody, for being loyal followers um, and supporting the work that we do here. So today, um, before I recap on what we're getting ready to, um, Brittany and I are getting ready to talk about, um, Brittany Johnson has been volunteering, which she's, she's in the lobby. Um, she's been volunteering here at the center for a couple months, right, Brittany? Yep. Um, so she's a newer volunteer and she's a registered behavior technician. And the reason I chose to ask her to come on here is her and I have some fascinating conversations. Um, she works with children within the autistic spectrum. Um, she also focuses and has uh, education on applied behavior analysis. So when we get together and talk and she walks me train, watches me train, we have all kinds of fascinating conversations. So I just said, why not bring her on? So let me go ahead and do a recap of what's happened since the last time we've done Coffee with the Critters. Wow, I should have shut the door. That's how hard it's raining. Um, you can, um, what does that say? Join our email list. Okay, wrong one. You can join our email list too. That's where it's located on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. But also you can check out our events to see what's coming up. I need to update that because... Um, next weekend was supposed to be Deb Jones was going to be on with Coffee with the Critters. We're rescheduling that probably for July um, because next weekend you're going to see. Recap of last weekend, I was in Long Island giving a presentation at the Collaboration for Avian Wellness. Um, you can find out more information about them at c4aw.org. Um, we had we spent the whole weekend talking about um, avian behavior training enrichment. It was great. Um, I saw it was nice to see how many people were already members, either level one members or level two members of the Animal Behavior Center, our online learning program. Um, they wore their blue shirts. Um, there was also a lot of people there from that are in our, our projects. Speaking of one right there, Diane Hyde, Sharon Collins. Uh, Paula, there's so many people. Um, so there I got to hold the uh, famous prints. Um, there's, <laughs> I didn't tell Sharon and Quentin I was going to post this, but I already posted it last week. So it was just great um, hanging out with everybody, getting to meet the new people, and um, hanging out with the ones I already know. So there was a lot of people there, like I said, these are everybody that was there that are members of the Parrot Project, our online learning program for people living with parrots. Um, hey, Kelly. Kelly says, love my Sundays with you. I love having you guys on here. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, there is already another C4AW event planned. And um, I think you're going to be seeing a save the date coming out hopefully this week. So next week, Coffee with the Critters, I will have it. I just don't know when I'm going to have it um, because at the time that I will be usually live streaming, I will be on the road driving from Las Vegas into Kanab, Utah, where I am going back there um, and picking up and bringing home the awesome sunshine. 
So um, Sunshine has a huge story. After Sam passed away here, I thought, what other animal out there can I help? Um, I've got the room to help some, some animal, whatever the species may be. Um, so I picked Sunshine. I know Sunshine. I've met him a couple of times out at Best Friends Animal Society in Kanab, Utah. Um, Sunshine has been, he was surrendered over 11 years ago and deemed unadaptable uh, because he's, he's pretty dangerous as far as he will bite skin as soon as he can get a hold of it. So I contacted Best Friends and said, would you consider letting me bring him back here for training and still have him up for adoption. So I head out to get him next week and pay attention to, I'll be live streaming a lot. Let's just say that. Uh, and I'll let you know where to go. But um, a couple other things that has happened here last week, um, the channel 13 action news got in touch with me, wanted to um, do a segment on Rocky, our Moluccan cockatoo, um, his story and the reason he's the mascot behind the center. So I don't know if you guys saw that segment. It was pretty cool. Um, news anchor Lisa Guyton, um, she's there in the black and white shirt, contacted me. She wanted not only to cover the fact that Rocky was in the commercial, but his story. Um, the Stanley Steamer commercials started airing, I believe it's tomorrow, it's going to be two weeks ago. Um, so there's four commercials that are are were recorded. Um, two of them are out already. I hear people are seeing the uh, wedding commercial and the kitchen, the kitchen scene. So that was a lot of fun. And save the date for, I have to look, July 7th, I believe it was. Hey, Ray. Um, July 7th, I believe it is save that date because we are going to be live streaming with the creative director, Jim McCabe of Stanley Steamer and um, Glenn, the owner of their production studio. We're going to be talking about Rocky and the commercials he was in and how enriching, how enriching that was for us. So I'm showing this photo because during the news segment shoot, I turn around to see what the volunteers are doing behind the camera and they're back there goofing off, doing something with this plant. But um, <laughs> I was just gave them the eye like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> so save the date, uh, Sunday, July 7th, I believe it is, for the Coffee with the Critters with Stanley Steamer and the production company. Okay, so pay attention to the Sam I Can Foundation's Facebook page. It is getting ready to blow up. Um, what we do is we pick, we people, this is a new nonprofit that we started in Sam's honor and it's not just for birds, it's for all animals. What we do is we pick particular cases where animals and their people are in need and we raise funds to um, help them and we live stream to help share a story and the education behind that story. Um, I'm going to make a post this evening um, and we will be live streaming this probably really heavy starting next weekend. Um, we had a meeting this week with the founders of the Sam I Can Foundation and the attorney. I'm getting ready to make a post about this. And the attorney asked me, how are you going to get sunshine? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm flying out there to get him and I'm bringing him back and he's going to stay here for training. And he's like, why are you not using the Sam I Can Foundation funds to help get him back here? And I said, I don't want to take those funds uh, from the Sam I Can. He said, Laura, well, we all agreed that this is a story. This is a story for education. Um, use those funds. So we are going to start telling a story on sunshine um, and having a fundraiser starting this evening on the Sam I Can Foundation. But you are definitely going to watch, want to watch the live streams from the Sam I Can Foundation's Facebook page starting next weekend. I'm going to be telling a story. I'm very adamant about it. And um, Sam will live on through that. Um, 
through the work we do. Okay, so let me go ahead and bring in Brittany. Brittany, you're coming on in three seconds. There Hi. she is. <laughs> so this is, uh, thanks for joining me today, Brittany. Thanks for having me. Um, you're welcome. Um, I know many people that come on here with me as guests get really nervous in the beginning. And I told you, don't get nervous um, because this this next hour is going to fly. Right. Um, yeah. So, Brittany, you've been here at the center for a couple of months. You saw that we were looking for volunteers. You applied. And um, what made you excuse me, what made you interested in applying for the volunteer position? Well, um, I'm working on my master's and wanted to be a BCBA, but... Board Certified Behavior Analyst, just for those that may not know. Um, and the more I was working on it, the more it wasn't really fitting what I wanted to do because I want to work directly with the kiddos. I don't want to like move up and get farther away from that. Um, and I actually talked to one of my friends who's a RBT and she mentioned the Animal Behavior Center and then I also talked to my current BCBA and she told me about the volunteering application actually and sent it to me so I applied. Well um, in your you live an hour north of us. Yeah I'm in Canton Michigan. So who who do, well it doesn't matter they found out about the Animal Behavior Center? I'm assuming Facebook. I think my friend knows somebody that volunteered, but yeah, I thought it's ABA. So I thought I'd try it out. Sure. Yeah. Great. So you found out that we use applied behavior. We teach people about um, through working with animals. We teach people about behavior through working with animals using applied behavior analysis. So that's what attracted you to the volunteer position. Yeah, absolutely. ABA cool. is great. So <laughs> ABA is what? ABA is great, so. <laughs> um, and I don't think for anybody that's uh, any of our followers, we need to say what ABA is, Applied Behavior Analysis. I think a lot of people know um, what we're talking about. So, um, yeah, and then you and I have had some fascinating conversations um, in applied behavior analysis. And let me talk about this too. You are the one that I was telling you yesterday, I, I stole a line from you and I'm <laughs> using it everywhere. Um, I stole a line from you because never in my whole history of working with animals and applied behavior analysis, have I heard anything negative about applied behavior analysis until like two years ago. Uh, my friend Patricia Anderson said, yeah, some of it can get a little controversial. And I was just like, what, it, what is there? Once you understand it, what, what is there even con controversial about applied behavior analysis? Um, you mentioned to me it to me as well. And then I made a post here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page probably about a month ago um, stating why we don't need to use the word no here at the center and it blew up into all this controversy and somebody came on and was really bashing ABA. And I was talking to you about that when we were driving home from the wildlife festival. Mm -hmm. and, that. and I said, I couldn't believe somebody was on there saying negative things about applied behavior analysis. And the thing that came out of your mouth, I was just like, that is beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> and you had mentioned, those are usually the cases when people don't think ABA works, that is user error. Yeah. And I loved it. I was just like, you're exactly right. Those are the cases where maybe the people don't thoroughly understand. Yeah, it can be tricky. <laughs> it can be tricky. Um, but like I say, when you know better, you do better. I mean, I'm, I don't ever stop learning. I'm always reading different cases. And in my studies, in my master's level classes of applied behavior analysis, um, I have one of my favorite books in the whole world right here called Principles of Everyday Behavior Analysis. Um, what we studied, we never studied anything about animals. It was all about people, different casework. Um, in scenarios and how to change that behavior. Um, so yeah, Dr. Patricia Anderson is on here right now and she says, 
people misunderstand it so sad because it is, is the most humane way to interact with others, humans and non-humans. So Brittany, I think you're right. It's just maybe not understanding user error um, because it is the most humane way I have found to work with anything that I encounter. So what got you interested, Brittany, in um, how'd you first stumble on applied behavior analysis? Well, when I was at Western, I actually was a double major biochemistry, biomedical, but I really wasn't digging the biology. So I took one psych class and fell in love with psychology. And from there, some of the beginning classes, uh, the first one was like the pre-ABA and it was so intense and so like informational that it just like sucked me right in. And then from there, like the practicums and the different jobs I have encountered um, and just seeing it work firsthand, like the experience itself. Um, I've had a couple kiddos graduate and it's like the greatest feeling in the whole world because I applied it and it worked and now they can live their most independent life. So. Yeah. And it's um, like so much about behavior is shaping in um, we are who we are today because of how the world and our experiences have shaped us to be what we are, to be where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I know I talked to you a lot about Joel Vitovic. He uh, works here at the autism model school. He's an amazing man to talk to and he's in it for um, the kiddos, you know, and I've been to the autism model school numerous times and I see how well it works in effective use of reinforcers um, that really empowers these kids for job skills. Um, yeah, so um, we have a BCBA on here. She's also in the membership program and in the Parrot Project, Kimberly Perry. I got to meet her for the first time last week at the C4AW event. She said, me too. It was my initial psychology class that got me interested. So then, Brittany, what, you, okay, so what got you interested in working in the field of people or children within, within the autistic spectrum? Well, I was actually volunteering at the, the Michigan Autism Conference for um, one of my old professors. And at the end of it, they had like a little table set up for different jobs in the psychology field. And I was offered a job at the Great Lakes Center for Autism Support, or what is it? Great Lakes Center for Autism Treatment and Research. And I had no idea what it was. I never was interested in working with kids. I was more interested in schizophrenia. Um, so I went. And, Interesting. Yeah, so I went and checked it out and I was so shocked and surprised. Like I had no idea there were facilities where you where they actually had the kiddos live there. I knew nothing about it. So I tried it out and working there for a year and a half, I was completely devoted to helping kiddos with autism. Like it changed my whole life working there. And was part of that because you saw how once you understand how ABA works, it really empowers these kids. And just reading it and applying it is so different. Like you can read it and think you understand it, but once you're put in a situation where you have to respond quickly, then it, it that's when it clicks for you having to apply it and actually seeing it be effective as well. Sure. Um, I'm glad you said that because so many people, like I'm, I tell them, you can be as book smart as you want in ABA and in understanding terminology. And, um, but it really comes together when you apply it yep. and you, you get, you become better through the application. Absolutely. Um, in numerous experiences. And you get back what you apply. If you're not in it for the kiddos, you're not going to see improvement because you're not there for them. But if you're willing to like put in the time and really make sure you're running the programs right and responding quickly and effectively, then it makes a difference. Sure. And that's why, um, I mean, here I've let the world shape what they want the animal behavior center to be to a certain degree. 
um, which is why we do our live streaming services because we're reaching people all over the world. We just had somebody join last week from Belgium. Wow. Um, yep. We have we have people in our online membership. We have level two, level one, level two, and then we have the projects, which is species specific. Uh, we have people from all over the world. And what's really cool, and I was telling somebody about this recently, is some of these people in other countries don't have the opportunity to gain this kind of information. And this is how I can reach anybody who wants to do better. And we focus on the animals um, and numerous different species because all these different species, uh, some things may be like, okay, it may be the same behavior I need to teach. I need to teach this animal to station. If I need an animal to do something, I reinforce the behavior that I want to see maintain or increase. So I may be able, I may be teaching a parrot to station next day, teaching a bear to station next day, teaching a deaf and blind dog to station. I was just doing this last night on the front porch. Um, that deaf and blind dog gets away from you. Um, you're going to have to capture it. Mm -hmm. In danger, so it doesn't um, hurt itself. But if you teach it what teach it what you want it to do, instead of constantly telling these animals and these kids what not to do, because right. some of the side effects of using you know no, how you, however you if you're using it as a positive punisher to get them to stop behavior, you know there's side effects of using aversive to control behavior. They may right. work. But right, for a little bit, but you're not giving that alternative appropriate behavior when you punish. A lot of times that's where you like go wrong is telling your kids like, no, no, we don't do this. Don't do this. But then they don't know what they're supposed to do then. Like give them an alternative that's positive and appropriate. Sure. That earns reinforcement. Yeah. And yeah. then they know next time they like have an idea of what you're looking for too. Yeah. That um, something I could correlate that to is um, like last night we were live streaming in the parrot project with Coco. He's going to nail you as soon as his hand, as soon as your hands come close to him. So I'm working with counter conditioning and desensitization to get my hands closer and closer to him. Um, that's why we teach a head target. Um, I need his head up here not down here where it can bite my fingers. So instead of telling him, if I kept telling him, no, 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 don't put your feet, your beak down towards my fingers. I'm I could very likely reinforce the very behavior I'm trying to extinguish. Right. Um, so tell him what to do instead. So that's why I teach a hard head target. I want, and he sees my hand and he'll walk up and stick his head into it. And I can hold my hand high to keep his beak high while I'm down here working on a foot target, which turns into a nail trim. Right. You want to talk about nail trims. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, um, Kimberly Perry says something real quick. The awesome thing is the field is really expanding into other disabilities because they realize the research is there to support it. Um, all these different. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Kimberly. Um, and even Joel mentioned, you know, ABA has pigeonholed itself into just working, I mean, within the field of autism when it works across the board. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do we want to talk about nail trims? Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, go okay. ahead. Oh, <laughs> Um, all right, so we brought this up yesterday. Yep. Um, I had a really cool experience at work. Um, well, first I was watching Lara trim Milo's hooves, and she, pig. she was tapping his feet with the the she, the shears shears before doing the clip to kind of like desensitize him to that sensation because the the hit is way more aversive than a little tiny clip. So I thought that was cool. And then I uh, was working on some toenail clipping, which can be difficult sometimes. Um, and so I thought maybe I should try tapping the nail clippers on the on the toenail before taking that clip and see if that helps like sensitize it a little bit. And it actually really worked. And I thought that was amazing. 
So it doesn't really matter on the species so much as just like that behavior and figuring out what works for that kid or that animal. It's all individualized, but it can work across species. Yeah. And it's all about the laws of behavior, not necessarily the species. It, it, it is the laws of behavior um, and, and how it works. So, yeah, um, I remember like one of the things I tell people is um, one of the most common mistakes in behavior and training and shaping behavior is taking too big a steps in the, in the, in the shaping class. You know, when you're working with um, something that doesn't understand what's coming out of your mouth, when you're working with an individual that doesn't understand language, speech, how we're speaking, um, hmm, you have to look at it from their perspective. You know, in my work with working with animals, um, you take too big a steps with an animal that doesn't understand, you're probably gonna get confusion and you're probably gonna reinforce behaviors labeled as aggressive. And then with frustration comes aggression too. Yeah. So. Yeah. And if you're constantly asking the individual to do something, do something, but the individual doesn't understand, now you're starting to pair your interaction with frustration, okay. um, which can actually punish your session. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Some thank different you, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Emma, my BCBA commented. I saw I was saying thanks. Oh, who is she? Uh, Emma. <laughs> yep. Yep. She made such good progress with this client and toenail clipping. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's all about behavior. Um. So, and that's what I see a lot from where I'm at. If the animal's lunging or biting, identify why. Then you've identified the reinforcer behind that bite. And then you can back up in your shaping plan or eliminate that reason altogether. Um, I need animals to thoroughly understand what I'm asking. Because if I don't, somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah. So I know when I was taking my master's level courses in applied behavior analysis, I thought, well, if this doesn't end up working out for me in the field of animal behavior, and I don't know how that would work. I, with you saying you were interested in schizophrenia, was it schizophrenia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought it's another area of interest would be me working in the mental health field within the, the human community. I would be very interested in that. Um, I would also be thoroughly absorbed into it, you know, because I have spent some time in some different um, facilities where I'm just like, wow, ABA really needs to be applied here. Yeah. Really, yeah. Because what I saw was it was just, it was controlling behavior with a lot of force and restraint and medication. In medication. Yeah, there's a great book out. It's called, I haven't read it yet, but I've heard plenty about it and I still need to. Ana uh, what is it? Anatomy of an Epidemic and just how I'm medication. Right oh, okay. <laughs> medication is like heavily used to sedate all these people, but the behavior still exists. They're just underneath all this medication. So when they come off of that medication, you still have this problem to fix, if not worse, because it's just been laying dormant. So yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, no, <laughs> you know, I, I've got that circle. I am going to look that up as long as it, it's on Audible and listen to it. And listen to it while I'm <laughs> driving from Utah to Ohio next week. <laughs> That's really cool that you bring that up. In our memberships, we have podcasts and I have at least two podcasts on behavior modification and medication. Um, and it's just, I mean, that's one area that I am very passionate about. And, and one of it was, um, are you seeing true behavior when medication is masking it? You know what I mean? Right. 
if you're going to use medication, please tell me there's a behavior modification plan in place as well. Right. Um, yeah. So I know that's, that's huge. That's a huge concern among species. Um, yeah, definitely. It's a quick, it's a quick cover to fix a, a long-term problem if it's not being addressed. Yeah. Um, and is it really changing behavior? And oh, changing yeah. behavior for the good. And right. do you have to keep increasing doses because it tolerance? Yeah. 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 Um, before I knew better, I was, uh, it was suggested to use medication for a behavior issue. And I used it once and I'm just like, Mm. I'm not, I'm seeing a animal in a vegetative state, you know, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this. So right. I stopped it and just put a behavior modification plan in place. And that behavior modification plan happens to be the mascot of our center <laughs> because it works. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Kelly Montgomery says she just finished the silent patient have you heard of that? I have not. I'll have to look at it. Look into it. Yeah, I'm going to look it up too. Silent patient. <clears throat> a lot of the stuff I listen to, read, educate myself on uh, with applied behavior analysis is um, usually not even directed towards animals. Um, there's a book out there that I recommend. Oh, it's great. And I can't remember what the name of it is. <laughs> it's on Audible. Um, okay. Yeah. What are some of your other favorite? Do you have some other favorite books, Brittany? Oh, man. I The only book that really I read all the way through and enjoyed it, because I'm not really into textbooks. I mostly have textbooks from school, was, oh, what's it called? I think it's just Principles of Behavior. It's, a, it's not the Cooper book, but the white one that I used for my pre-ABA class. A white I read it front to back. Yeah. I read it front to back and it like just the examples, the way it's written. It's a Malat book from uh he was one of the professors at Western. Yep. Um, but the Cooper White book is really good from what I hear too. There's a new edition coming out. My BCBA rants about it all the time. So Yeah. I think a, that might be the one I have downstairs. Okay. Yeah, that one's super, super popular. It has like the graph on the front. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There's yep. a new edition coming out. So that would be a good good purchase to keep up to date on everything ABA. Okay. Okay. Um, one of my favorite authors is uh, Paul Chance. Are you familiar with him? Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah, he writes a lot of books on ABA. But that book I was telling you about that I listened to that's fabulous, it's called, I'm going to have to play it here for a second and pause it. There you go. It's called, this is what it is. Can you see it? Yeah. Back to what is it? Have you heard of this book? Nope. <laughs> it's called Back to Normal. And I learn about behavior and my application with animals, but this is called Back to Normal. Why Ordinary Childhood Behavior is Mistaken for ADHD, Bipolar, and Autism Spectrum Disorder. Sure. That, was, that, was a, that was a good book. It's a, it's a big eye-opener. I'm going to have to read that. Yeah. Back to All right. right. And that's by, um, ooh, I don't know if I want to try to pronounce this one. And we go, <laughs> no, no, Lottie. Yeah. Okay. So um, with your education in applied behavior analysis and your work here at the center, in a million different directions to go. Um, I, I know you tell me you like it here. And I always, I'm always checking in with the volunteers. How you doing? Uh, is every, how's everything going? What do you want to see changed? So do you find that a lot of the things here apply? I know you were watching the one time that I was training snow. Oh yeah, that was great. That was pretty cool. It was. It definitely does apply because you're just with that. That was trying to like shape and get her lower and lower and lower. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I like to see like the bird stuff too. I'm trying to think of uh, like, why do you like to see the bird stuff? Because it's something maybe you're not familiar oh, with. Yeah. It just like expands my mind a bit to see it with a different species and just comparing because it's the same behaviors, but they're being expressed differently because it's a bird instead of a kid. There's the four functions of behavior, the attention, tangible, escape, and automatic. And you see that with the birds too. Um, people, it's obviously a lot more complicated because you've had you have all those different reasons stacked on top of each other. But um, yeah, no, it just helps me kind of expand and think outside the box a little bit. We get so stuck in this, the like the rules, the principles that we don't think outside of it and try to like expand. I don't know how to say what I'm I trying to say. Yeah, it's ex kind of expand. We're just not getting stuck in the routines of the same stuff. Well, maybe we, maybe we bring you in the bird room and have that you do a little bit more with the birds. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, that's why I like working with species I've never worked with before because I I need to understand you. And a lot of times, tell me if you find this working with you, with your your people. Um, a lot of times, people will come up to me and say, "Oh, this animal's favorite reinforcers are this," and then so I, I gather them. I go in front of the animal, and they're like. Puh. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. That's not it at all. <laughs> right. That's when you come in with a preference <laughs> assessment. <laughs> so we have a couple different kinds of preference assessments, but you could pretty much just pick up two things, hold it out, and see which one they go for. And then you know, motivation is like the biggest, I think that's the hardest part is like you have to find a, re a motiva motivator that's strong enough to make whoever want to do what you're asking. So if you're giving them like goldfish and they don't care for goldfish, you're, they're not going to do anything that you ask because they don't want to. And who cares about goldfish? They want animal crackers. If you bring out the animal cracker, they're like, yeah, I'll do whatever you want. So motivation is like such a huge part in anything you try to do with anyone or any species. I think a lot of people um, don't understand what motivation looks like or how to get it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, some words in the community that have neg negative connotations are manipulation, control, and consequences. Yes. That's a part of our everyday life. We're all manipulating our environment to get the behaviors, to get things that are desirable to us. Right. We manipulate, we control, um, we can't just have our second grade children running all over the world. We need to control them um, <clears throat> for their safety. Right. So we can get that control and that, and they want to participate through reinforcing behaviors. You want to see maintain or increase. Right. Um, what else? Oh, and consequences. I remember I was at a seminar it had nothing to do with, working with animals and somebody they were asking for I can't remember something that happens in every <clears throat> excuse me in everyday life and I said consequences and he looked at me he's like whoa that's brutal and I was just like what <laughs> what do you mean that's brutal <laughs> it happens every time we make a move right <clears throat> so um Daphne, Daphne is on here. She's from Washington. She said, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, calls it brainwashing. <laughs> I've heard that too. I've definitely heard that. I've also, uh, during like actually working, I've been called a drill sergeant because you have to be consistent. Also with the consequence thing, um, a lot of times it kind of freaks people out when they see their kid crying when I'm working with them. And I'm just like, yeah, it happens because I'm not giving in to what they originally would get. So if they cried and they would get the candy or the pop or the iPad or whatever, and I come in there and I'm like, no, sorry, you got to ask the right way. They're going to cry more. And a lot of times that freaks people out. That that consequence of me not giving in is the screaming and the crying. So it's kind of like misunderstanding. It happens a lot. Yeah, exactly. well, the kid is crying because that undesired behavior has been reinforced prior to you coming in. Yep. So how is that bad on you? 
<laughs> right. I'm just like, I know they're crying. I know I make them cry a lot, but we're getting there. We're working through it. Just hang in there with me. And now you'll see the, the kiddo not crying and sitting at the table 15 minutes straight doing all the work, getting his reinforcer on his way. Happy as can be. It sure. just takes time and consistency. Yeah. Yeah. And it could, it could be the equivalent here of a dark, a dog excessively barking because it's been used to getting a reinforcer and it's now no longer coming mm -hmm. because we're changing and delivering that reinforcer for an alternate behavior. Yeah. That is healthy for the future of this animal. Yes. We're just untraining what everybody's already trained. Yep. And sometimes that can be hard when they're very heavily reinforced for so long, which sometimes it's not the parent's fault either, though. Mm -hmm. like they get put in these situations where they have a kiddo with very, very strong aversive behaviors, like, for instance, um, self-interest behavior. Oh, I've seen a lot of kiddos that actually smash their heads into the wall. The parents don't know what to do in that situation when it arises, so they start offering stuff, iPad, food, whatever you want, because they want their kid to stop hurting themselves. And that's understandable if you have no idea what to do and you're seeing this, so you're going to give whatever, but that reinforces that bad behavior. You're giving them what they want for hitting their head, so they're learning. In the past, this works, so I'm going to do it in the future to get what I want. And if you don't follow through with your, with your behavior modification plan of redirecting it towards another behavior, then it, when that smashing your head against the wall is intermittently reinforced, when those times that the reinforcement doesn't come, you can, the behavior of the, hit, the kid hitting his head against the wall becoming harder and harder can be reinforced. Right. And then it's, it's reinforced even stronger now because they've learned. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. I have to keep doing this until I get it. And that and that's that's a big a big spot too because the behaviors increase. There's an extinction burst. So a lot of times parents think if it's a with their kiddos, they think, well, this isn't working because now they're crying harder. Now they're punching me. Now they're doing all this, but you have to stick out the the worst before it gets better to get better. Yeah, that happens here. Um, for example, like I've seen, I have to control behavior of animals and people here for the future of the future wellness of the animal and the education of the people people here. Um, uh, we see extinction bursts. They barely happen anymore with Rocky and his screaming. It. I don't see those extinction bursts here anymore. I haven't seen them in a while, but the behavior, this animal has learned that screaming gets attention. <clears throat> and when it's intermittently reinforced unknowingly, this is why we don't, we don't let anybody in the bird room and right. they understand what they're doing. Right. Because the parrots here are some of the most complex animals we work with. Um, and I always tell people the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to keep. That is the bird. That is the parrot. Yeah. Um, so when I see an extinction burst happening, Rocky just screams and screams and that, that abnormal repetitive behavior of twirling around and around. When people don't know what that twirling means, I often hear, oh, that's cute. And I was like, no, that's frustration. That's anxiety. Oh. That's anxiety. He sees something he can't get to. And if somebody goes over and taps on the window, they can actually reinforce. So then Rocky starts doing that behavior more to get the attention, but that person is no long, is not paying attention. So mm -hmm. Rocky goes into a scream. And if the scream works and it, and it can, they look up, bam, just the eye contact is enough of attention as a reinforcer. Yeah. Yep. Even with the kiddos, eye contact can work. And also with eye contact, we'll be doing, if we're doing programs and you look at the answer, sometimes kids will look at your eyes to see where you're looking to find the answer. So anything you're doing, like you're you always say, them. right. So any, like, like you say, anything, if you're with an animal, you're training them, like anything you're doing, that's training them. So anything we do, like, you, like getting punched or they knock something over and you laugh because it's funny, but you accidentally la like you could be reinforcing just by laughing, by looking, by responding to them doing 
any of these bad behaviors. And, but some of those behaviors are hard to not respond to also like aggression. If it's attention maintained and they're punching you, you can't just let them punch you. You have to block, mm -hmm. but even blocking could reinforce. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely tricky for sure. Sure. So careful. Yeah. And, um, I don't know how or if this would apply to you, but a lot of when I'm interacting with an animal, like I see people and I will tell people if an animal is hurting you, stop it. Stop that behavior immediately. Do what you have to, to get that behavior to stop. But then once you stop it, think a behavior mod, this needs training because it's already being trained. You're already taught it. You know, you're, something's already, it's happening for a reason. Um, Stop it and then come up with a behavior modification plan or a training plan for the next time it happens. Identify those cues. What did that animal froze for a period of seconds before the undesired behavior happened? So when I see that, before I see that freeze happen again, I'm going to train that animal as many different behaviors as I can, such as nose target, foot target, um, station, so when I see that freeze, I know that freeze is a cue that, boom, this is getting ready to happen. So when I see that freeze, I can say, oh, there's the antecedent to the right. behavior. Cue it to do an alternate behavior you've already taught it to do. Yep, we then, do that too. Yeah. Um, what you're talking about is called precursor behavior. So um, sometimes kiddos will like, get really frustrated, they'll clench up, their face will get red. That's a precursor to, I'm about to punch you, hit you, bite you, depending on the kiddo, of course. Some kiddos, that's as far as it gets. But sometimes that can be a precursor for that bad behavior. We'll do, um, we'll teach protocols when they're not upset so that they understand what to do when they are upset. So we have like a relax protocol. If someone's really, really upset, we'll teach relax means go to your room and lay in your bed. So then if that precursor is coming for being really, really upset, you say, hey, let's go relax. And then they go lay down and take a break in the room before they can get to that point of escalation. Yeah, very interesting. Um, oh, I know I was gonna, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about um, distant antecedents for undesired behavior. And let me even clarify desired, undesired, good, bad. Undesired behavior is something that's undesired by me. It serves a purpose for that animal or it wouldn't exist. Right. Um, so if it's, un I mean, I have to be happy in this equation too. If I am not happy doing what I'm doing, my behavior of doing it is going to be punished. <laughs> <laughs> I need to work, I need to live happily with these animals. I want these animals to live happily with me. If I cannot provide that for them, I will move them somewhere that they can be happier than with me. However you determine happy. Right. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about um, distant antecedents for undesired behavior. Uh, Rocky keeps coming to mind because Rocky is full of all this plush, plethora of unhealthy behaviors. Unhealthy meaning unhealthy for him because his life was very full of stress and anxiety. How do we identify what that even looks like? Right. You know, um, but some different, here's the thing with counter conditioning. We just had a podcast on counter conditioning and desensitization two months ago. I don't want the animal to even have the opportunity to practice the undesired behavior in the first place. So if I see an animal doing something and I'm not exactly sure what it is, I'm like, oh, I don't really know what this means. And I can find out what that means through training. Um, I can find out what that means through observing and letting it follow through. But if I think I may not want it going the direction it is, I'll redirect it immediately so it doesn't have the opportunity to earn. So that encounter doesn't have the opportunity to earn that animal a reinforcer. Absolutely. We do that. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, yeah. We do that with the programs, um, the airless teaching. So if we are, sometimes if you let a kiddo respond, 
and the the response is incorrect like a picture card or something like that and then you go to prompt but they're stuck on that card that they originally touched sometimes it's better just to direct them to the correct answer first so that there isn't an opportunity for the incorrect answer to even get stuck in their head or in that chain yeah yes. um so one of the things what i was talking about Once the animal learns, hey, look what I got from doing this behavior. I like this. Well, I might not like it, but the animal <laughs> is doing it. Um, then you have to, the animal has already learned, boom. And this is like history of reinforcement. The longer the animal keeps doing that behavior and earning that reinforcer, sometimes people say, oh, it's just, that's one of my labels that I'm just like, oh, the terrible twos. Oh, they're terrible twos. I'm like, there's nothing terrible about the twos. That's all learning. That that animal is learning. This gives me desired behavior. And the longer you let the dig continue in your beautiful yard, maybe undesirable by me, but the animal's obviously earning reinforcement from it. It's not undesirable by it. The longer you let that dig happen, the stronger that behavior becomes the concern with that is usually and this is my experience only the longer it takes to change it oh yeah absolutely um but then so you come in after three months of this dog digging and you change it to earn a reinforcer for an alternate behavior the concern there is once the reinforcer stops for that alternate behavior the animal's going to go right back to this Right. As a history of reinforcement. Well, you can also um, transfer the control. So like if you're using an edible, pair it with like a toy or something. So then the dog is focused more on the toy and you can fade that edible out or still keeping the reinforcer. Edibles are tricky too, because you don't want to fill them up. You run out of, you run out of using that motivator because the satiation. So it's easier to use things like toys or iPad or TV or social praise even too. So, yeah. And so many of the reinforcers we use here, I don't know if you've been able to see it or not. Um, so many of the reinforcers we use here are attention. Yep. Attention and tactile interaction. Which is great. That's great. Yeah. Then you you, you're not constantly having to feed and then lose that behavior when you don't have that food. Right. And you and I tell people, um, if, you, if you're only using food as a reinforcer, your only reinforcers are food. You're going to find yourself stuck. Mm -hmm. You're going to find yourself in a situation where the animal is over threshold. That food is not going to work. I don't. And then I see a lot of people starting to deprive food more to make it of higher value, now you're, this is impacting the health of this animal. Yeah. Uh, we just had this conversation in level two in a live stream the other night about using deprivation. Deprivation <clears throat> is not about depriving food. <clears throat> it's about the longer a positive reinforcer is withheld, the higher value it becomes. Um, then you better have a big list of them because mm -hmm. my treat may work with the dog right here but when i take it to the vet and it's getting its temperature taken <laughs> and mm -hmm. i don't want to take that treat <laughs> right I'm just on that right now what's that not focused on the food right now <laughs> right wrong end <laughs> yeah so that's why i um tell people <clears throat> build your list of reinforcers try to get them to 10 and, yeah. and that can be tough. It can be. And it switches day to day too with the kids. Anyways, I've had kiddos. I could have 20 toys laying in front of me that they loved last week and not a single toy even sparks their interest. So you have to be quick. You have to be on it. You have to like wipe the board and bring a whole new set of toys out then like just to find that motivation. Otherwise my session is you don't get responses. They're wandering off doing something else because they don't care if you don't have something they want. Yeah. Um, uh, what were you just saying that made me think 
Oh, you said something about toys last week. They were, you had motivation with the toys last week, but this week you've got nothing. So many times people will say, and they'll keep throwing that toy, but this worked, this worked. The, the animal, like, well, it's not working right now, so switch. You know? Right. Yeah, so when animals hear, well, and you see, through, we're shaping behavior by having volunteers start out here making enrichment because you're learning about that individual animal and the individual reinforcers and what that individual animal finds enriching. And you're working on putting enrichment items together to it's those enrichment items are part of our behavior modification plans. Right. If the animal is busy doing this, it can't do this excessively bark. Um, so we redirect, create motivation. Um, you just got a compliment from the awesome Ray down in Florida. She says, Brittany, you are a very smart young lady and the ABC is lucky to have you as you will both benefit from each other. Good luck on your journey. Very interesting coffee with the critters. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, all of our volunteers here are very highly valued. We are a team. The Animal Behavior Center would not be here without all of our volunteers. Um, it's a great team to be a part of. Everybody's really great at the center. And there's just plenty to learn. There's so many opportunities. Everybody's so open to be, to, you want to try this? You want to see this? You want to come see that? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. We learn from things we're not familiar, yeah. from encounters we haven't encountered before. That's why I'm like, oh, you have a groundhog that needs trained? This is working with wildlife rehabbers. Sure. Never done it before. Bring it on in. Right. You know, that's like with the black bears. We're live streaming in level two, um, some zoo training with the black bears. I'm sitting there watching from the outside. And I'm just like, show me normal every day. Well, show me what you do on a daily basis. And I'm sitting there watching these black bears paw at this, climb at this. So I'm just sitting there going but the one was interested in a hose as they were changing the water. So I was like, not only is it water could be a reinforcer, but water comes in many forms, drop, mist, ice, frozen. Um, why is it interacting with that water? What is the rate of the water at which it's coming out of the hose? Uh, what? My cat. Oh, <laughs> In the background chilling on the counter. <laughs> yeah, so we were talking about this. Were you here yesterday when I was talking about, oh, how we shaped snow, our deaf and blind dog, to enjoy a bath? It started with a drip coming down from uh, one of the gutters in the center. And I noticed, we have pictures of this, of snow coming in with her face all black with mud. And I was like, oh, my God, where'd you, where'd you, what happened? <laughs> so I was like, what is it about that particular spot? So she's deaf and blind. What happened is she was walking, boom, water drop, hit, hit her head. So that's a cue here. Tapping is a cue. So um, sh she probably was just like, who tapped me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But then she felt the temperature difference on her paws on the ground. Why? What attracted her to that area? It was the coolness that was created from the water and she just started making patty cakes <laughs> and our beautiful lawn became, <laughs> was on its way to being destroyed. But I was just like, Oh, why is this happening? So I redirected it to the pool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, you know, somebody, do you know Amanda Nara? I do not. Okay. She said, yes, I was thinking the same thing. BCBA in the making. Oh, um, we'll have to, okay, there's a conversation going on while we're conversing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this live stream is over, Brittany. Feel free to go back. I'm, I'm on my way to see my dad for Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Yeah, happy Father's Day, everyone. Yeah, as soon as this live stream is over, but feel free to go back through here and address everybody's comments. There okay. A lot of people commenting. So, um, Brittany, I'd love to have you on again. We get yeah. a lot of compliments that this is this is great education and topic. 
Awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm down. This is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I was going to ask, so what do you think? <laughs> yeah, so that was cool. Definitely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So um, for those of you that might be interested in the work we do here at the Animal Behavior Center, we reach people all over the world through our live streams. We do that through our live streaming services. Level one is more for companion animals. And in there, we are currently talking about reactive dogs. And we have a reactive dog coming in that we're getting ready to live stream on Tuesday. Level two, we live stream numerous things. That's a weekly basis. Um, zoo Q and A's. We just had a live stream group discussion on Thursday night about approaches and working with fearful, oops, fearful animals. Um, that's where I'm showing my bear training, my live streams of the bear training, the black bear training, um, how we get them to do what we need to do. Um, and then we have our projects, which are species specific. Level one and level two are more about behavior and behavior with animals. Um, if People, those are meant to be bundled with projects, but definitely not necessary. So then our projects are our live streaming species specific, duck, dog, pig, parrot, uh, the snow project. And in the parrot project right now, this is Coco, uh, um, parrot that came to us from a zoo who will bite hands this, as soon as it sees it. So um, we're currently talking about shaping a foot target and we're going to turn this into all the behaviors you can get from shaping a foot target. Um, Coco needs to be trained for nail trims. So we're going to start live streaming nail trims with um, Coco. <clears throat> um, our referral program. Some people are busy. <clears throat> and, and this was originally designed for rescues. And I've just recently opened it up to the world. Our referral program is... For every five people that we get signed up into the projects or memberships and referred to us from you, you get a free online behavior consultation with me. So that way I can help keep you or you and your traps trained and knowing what to do to keep behaviors going in the right direction. And well, I think this is last but not least, don't forget about our October workshop um, where myself and Dr. Deb Jones are giving a two-day animal behavior and training workshop. A lot of a mix of lecture with a lot of application. So there you go. That's this episode of Coffee with the Critters. Brittany, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, enjoy your day today with your father. Thanks. You're welcome. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.